Good morning, friends. Good morning, everyone. We're just so glad to be here on our day two of our Summer Institute. I think yesterday went incredibly well. It was a really uplifting, in spite of some of the challenges with the material and what we're dealing with and some of the technical challenges, um, everyone kept faith and um, the content arising from the breakout rooms was just fabulous. Um, and the plenaries were inspiring. Um, we just left the day feeling very encouraged and excited about day two. I want to um, acknowledge our co-chairs, Trevor Hancock and Maya Gisselson for their leadership and support and our scientific program committee. I also want to acknowledge the PHABC team, which always shows up. In particular, Christina Harding, who's our coordinator, and Chris Munkowski, who's our office administrator, uh, both of whom really um, supported note-taking minutes, organizing, and coordinating yesterday. So very grateful to you guys for keeping faith with this process in a new environment and having the temerity to embrace the virtual universe for a summer institute. We are um, aware that it added a lot of stress. Um, and we're really grateful to you for managing that and bringing us to uh, such a great place. So it's my deep privilege. Stephanie, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> so we're really blessed. Yeah, yeah, we're really blessed to have the Manitoba Public Health Association involved in our Summer Institute, and more blessed to have Stephanie open us with a traditional welcome. Stephanie, my heart goes out to you. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so I just want to echo a little bit what Shannon had to say this morning. Yesterday was phenomenal. And um, if you're lucky enough to be here, um, you know, I guess you could probably also echo what I had to say that there was some wonderful discussion. It was probably one of the best conferences that I've been to, never mind that it was a virtual one. And so um, I was thinking about what I wanted to say this morning and um, I, I play my drum and I pray every morning and, and then I was asked to do that uh, for you. And so if it's all right, <laughs> um, I'd like to um, light a smudge for us this morning, just to center us in our thoughts for today. Uh, give some thanks for yesterday. Um, and I'm also gonna sing for you. And for that, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, just take a few minutes to kind of set some intentions for today. I'm going to sing, um, I guess I should also introduce myself um, by my spirit name. It's Kishkinawa um, Tashkurin Tichipoe, and that means uh, circling hawk. And the teaching that came with that uh, name was that I have the ability to walk through many worlds, and I can bring messages um, in between those worlds. And so... Um, I'm gonna, my, my background is um, Belgium, it's also um, Cree, um, from my grandmother's side, my father's grandmother, and um, I'm going to sing you an Anishinaabe song, because that's also from my territory, and, and the bear song is one of the songs that I carry. Um, there we go.
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cora. Um, I think I, I just needed to center myself and, and maybe center the rest of us. So um, thanks for that. Um, what I'd like to do now, is, depending on how we're doing for time, we're good. Um, is I'm going to share, I made a PowerPoint because Christina asked me to, and then I said I might not use it. Um, so we'll see how it goes, um, but there is one. Uh, so who am I? Uh, my name is Stephanie, like I said. Um, Told you my spirit name. I'm a citizen of the, the Manitoba Métis Federation. Um, I'm also president of the Manitoba Public Health Association. Um, I'm exiting my, my, my paid job, my paid position um, as director of programs and engagement for the Manitoba HIV program, um, which has been a wonderful role for me and has given me many opportunities um, and a good basis um, in infectious diseases and in harm reduction. Um, and coming in as tribal health educator for Southeast Regional Development Corporation, which is a tribal council here in Manitoba. I'm a master's of nursing student, um, and I've been a nurse uh, working in a variety of settings, including public health, uh, for the last 18 years. So, um, moving forward, oh, from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, I'd just like to start with a bit of a land acknowledgement from the territory that I am um, speaking from today. So the Manitoba Public Health Association operates on the original lands of the Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, um, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Denny people, and the homeland of, of my family and my, and my people, the Métis Nation. Um, I think we're very committed. Um, in, especially in Manitoba and the Prairie Provinces um, as a non-Indigenous organization to moving towards honoring the treaties that were the original intent of these treaties uh, that were originally signed on our land. And I know that's a little bit different um, than BC where, where you're operating mostly in unceded territory. Um, so just a little bit of perspective here. Um, this is the bear song. So if we share the presentations, this is the song that I sang this morning. I was going to play it and then I was told to be brave and to use my drum and sing it myself. Um, <laughs> so what did we do yesterday? Uh, uh, we had a wonderful opening. Um, I, I think the woman who, the um, Wet Sweat and woman that opened her name was Sandra, but I could be wrong and I don't have it in front of me, so I apologize if that's a mistake. Um, and then we, we moved on to talking about, um, you know, public health and the Anthropocene, so, and then moved into some breakout sessions. So that was yesterday morning, and I was thinking about some key takeaways that I might have um, from Trevor's presentation. And um, I learned something new, I didn't know it, uh, that we are in a new geological era that's called the Anthropocene. Um, and for me, I've always, I've probably been experiencing this uh, on some personal level for some time with the research that I'm interested in, you know, outside of nursing, uh, which is climate science and, and um, climate justice. And so for me, it is the, the sixth mass extinction on this planet. And I know that's very <laughs> doom and gloom, but um, I'm going to name it. That's how I've been seeing it. And so... Um, it's the biggest risk to public health for our generation, but possibly for um, the, you know, humanity has ever actually faced. And then we, we started talking about, uh, Maya uh, uh, moved us along to thinking about um, equity as interspecies and beyond just the equity that we normally see uh, uh, for um, for people and looking at animals and the land and the water and how do we how do we put that all together 
Um, and then uh, Dr. Shannon Waters came and talked about how Indigenous sovereignty, sovereignty is sustainability. And I think in BC, um, that's very poignant. Um, and then we did, uh, so I guess I really love this whole concept of, you know, think globally and act locally. And the, the global part of this was looking at, for me, from the breakout sessions, um, all of the interrelated systems that are affected by and contributing to um, climate change. Um, and also, I guess it would be the Anthropocene. And so, um, we, start, we talked about watersheds and health, we talked about sustainable um, agri-food systems, and we talked about uh, One Health uh, approach to the, the pandemic, um, and, and the concept of interspecies justice, which really um, kind of hit home for me. Um, we looked at mental health issues uh, around this, as well as pollution and ecotoxicity, and then how should Canadian public health respond to this climate emergency. Uh, and there was many good ideas coming out of the group. These are just some notes um, that I, I jotted down. Um, and then moving into the afternoon, we had a really um, good presentation from somebody who is new to me, Dr. Uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, talking about uh, uh, cultural evolution and societal transformation and understanding some of those basic concepts so we could think about um, I think really to start to set us up for today, but even some of the work that we did yesterday afternoon and thinking about how we can collaborate and pull our actions together as, as a society of public health professionals to really address uh, this crisis. Um, and so all kinds of approaches or epistemologies or ontologies were considered in this. And so uh, we, we looked at Indigenous approaches, we looked at uh, uh, feminist approach, uh, rights of nature as human right, faith and spirituality was the session that I was in and it was just so dear to my heart. Um, ecological economics, uh, justice, um, and then the work of the Cascade Institute. And so coming um, away from that, sorry, I'm a little bit backwards in my slides, uh, but one of the questions that came out was, you know, are we on the cusp of a norm cascade? Is this a tipping point for society and, and how we operate and how we, how we um, live in the world, our, our way of being, our way of, our way of knowing? And, um, and I kind of hope so. Uh, one thing that I, I took away is which way will we tip towards division or towards solidarity? And, and really, um, my key takeaway from, uh, Tad's discussion was uh, it's really up to us and one thing that came to me during this discussion that I didn't want to lose is that we can always go back to the seven teachings. I think if we are coming from a place in our decision making in our organizational structures um, and in our politics in terms of like, always going back to the concepts of love, respect, humility, truth, wisdom, honesty, and courage, um, that is going to be it's the how that is going to be what decides which way we go. I, I think if we move out of our head and into our heart and operate from those spaces, uh, we, we, we do stand a pretty good chance. Um, and so from the breakout sessions, uh, there was lots of really exciting uh, conversation. And one thing that I was noticing is how interrelated. I mean, we're saying that we're coming at this issue from all different perspectives and we're really honoring those perspectives. Um, however, a lot of people were coming to the same place, which is a shift is needed and, and how that's gonna happen is, I think is gonna come from a place of love. Um, so looking at things like community-driven policies and approaches, uh, storytelling, different ways of evaluating our programs, different, different ways of evaluating health, different ways of thinking about um, our planet are all going to be um, ways that we can move forward in this together. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's what I want to say about that, actually. Uh, I'm supposed to do some housekeeping today, and so I guess what I can say is uh, make sure you remember no chats are private, so even if you're messaging your buddy, um, that's going to be captured somehow, and so um, just be mindful of that. Uh, we are recording all the sessions, uh, and so please mute, mute your mics um, just as um, a way to um, honor those who are speaking. Um, 
And what are we going to do today? So I am going to provide an opening, which is happening right now. Um, and then uh, Mayor Fred Haynes, uh, Cora Houseworth, and Dr. Trevor Hancock are going to do a plenar plenary about uh, One Planet Living Cities, and we'll move into some breakout sessions, um, which you can see. If you haven't let Christina know which session you want to do, uh, please send her an email now, um, and then she can make sure you get slotted into the right spot. Um, otherwise, she'll just have to assign you to one. So, um, And then this afternoon, we're going to have uh, Dr. Margo Parks, uh, Dr. Teresa Healy, and Sandra Harris talk about citizen engagement and respecting diversity, political, and social action. And then we're actually going to get into local breakout rooms where we can have some meaningful discussion about what are some concrete next steps that we can take to kind of move uh, this movement forward. Um, I'm not going to do the closing remarks today. I believe that's the president and the public health president from the Yukon, but um, I'll let Christina let me, uh, figure that out after. Um, and I just wanted to say before I go that um, the reason why I chose to sing you, sing you the bear song this morning is when we go back to some teachings that I received about clans and the people from the bear clan um, are medicine people. And if you think about the seven teachings, uh, the bear also is representative of the concept of courage. And I'm really asking all of you to be fiercely courageous um, in how you work and to come from a place of the heart. And that's not going to be easy, but I think we can do it. So that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Wow, <clears throat> Stephanie, I am uh, so deeply grateful to you for your wisdom, your vision, your courage, your your spiritual uh, leadership, and um, and bringing that face forward to our community here is really important. We honor science, but beyond science, we're we're human beings um, with spiritual, emotional, and physical lives, and we, um, you know, connecting to that is actually so critical in terms of our ability to move forward effectively. So thanks for grounding us and opening our hearts today. And i um, very grateful. Uh, Teresa's back to do artwork for us. So we're really excited to have you, Teresa. And uh, without further ado, I'll pass the uh, microphone over to Trevor. Thank you and good morning everybody. Um, <clears throat> just before I start, let me just check in with Christina to see if there's anything else we need to add from your point of view. No, I think that was perfect. Um, oh, actually one other reminder too, just when you do have to step away from the meeting, um, please don't turn, exit out of the meeting, just turn off your camera, mute your audio, mute your mic and that way I can still slot you into your breakout rooms. So thank you very much and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, well, good morning then. And thank you, Stephanie, for a very wonderful opening and a, and a great summary of yesterday too. It sets us up beautifully for today. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the uh, three speakers. Well, I'm one of them, so I don't need to do that for myself. Um, but we have, uh, First of all, Mayor Fred Haynes, and Fred is, like myself, an Englishman, which means he enjoys a good pint of beer, which we've done a few times. Uh, he's a very accomplished guy, and I will simply leave you to read his resume, uh, but you might want to note, among other things, um, you always tread very softly around Fred, because he's also an eighth belt, or an eighth degree black belt in Aikido. Um, he's a very lovely guy, and I've really enjoyed working with him. Uh, and then Cora Holsworth, who's going to start us off, uh, who is an environmental consultant here in Victoria. Fred is the mayor of Saanich, I should have said. And uh, Saanich has taken up this notion of uh, a, a one planet community, a one planet uh, municipality. And there's a project called One Planet Saanich, which is part of a global project. And Cora has been the consultant and, and manager and leader for this project. And then I'm going to make some of the connections between that and healthy communities at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Cora and uh, it, take it away. Excellent. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Trevor, and honor to be uh, joining you. Uh, this has been a great session. I was able to uh, participate in a lot of yesterday as well. So there's been some great presentations and discussions and uh, that was a really great uh, summary of what happened yesterday. So thank you for that also. 
Um, so I'm coming to you today, as uh, Trevor mentioned, from uh, Saanich, uh, the Lekwungen and Wasanic uh, speaking peoples uh, nation, and I'm happy to be here. Um, so I will jump right in. And, and let me know if you can't see my slides. I've got my slide sharing. You should be able to see them now. Uh, just we let see me know them. If you, great. So I'm going to give an overview of what we mean by one planet living and its interconnections with the health, uh, with health. And Mayor Haynes and I will then talk about how we're using one planet living approach in Saanich. And Trevor is going to highlight how a sustainable city is a healthy city. And I think we've talked about that yesterday as well and give an overview of um, the importance of developing uh, community conversations on these issues. So we're in the midst of a human health crisis due to COVID-19, but as you heard from Trevor Hancock and Thomas Homer Dixon yesterday, we're also in the midst of interconnected and COVID-19 is starkly revealing our vulnerabilities to the increasing challenges we're facing as we bump up against the limits of our planet. These crises are being triggered because of the activities of our species and our sheer population size, uh, which are exceeding ecosystem limits. So as we've been talking about over the last little while, without a healthy planet, we can't have healthy people. And as Trevor noted yesterday, ecological crises, which are highlighted on this slide here, are the greatest threat to human health in the 21st century. COVID-19 is illuminating how widespread and systemic inequality is across the globe. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this image. It's uh, referred to as the donut, which was created by Kate Raworth. And it depicts graphically the social foundation, uh, which are those internationally agreed minimum social standards the, in the Sustainable Development Goals, and also the environmental ceiling, which consists of the nine planetary boundaries defined by the Stockholm Resilience Center. So the green space in the middle is the safe operating space for humanity. So to tackle our environmental challenges, we need to address equity. We need to make sure our demands don't exceed nature's supply. This fair share is where the ecological footprint comes in. It's a measurement tool we have to figure out how close or how far away we are from one planet living. The footprint was developed here in BC by William Reese and Matisse Wackernagel. It's an estimate of how much biologically productive land and water area an individual or population needs to produce all the resources it consumes and absorb the waste it generates. We have limited biocapacity on the planet, so only about a quarter of our planet's surface is currently ecologically productive. And scientists therefore estimate that our fair air Earth share is 1.5 global hectares per capita. I've been working with Jenny Moore, Dr. Jenny Moore at BCIT for the past few years to understand the ecological footprints of cities and to see how close or how far away from one planet living they are. So we used the tool that Jenny created during her PhD and that was under the direction of uh, Bill, Re Bill, Bill Reese, um, the creator of the EcoCity foot uh, Ecological Footprint. And uh, the tool that Jenny created is now being used by, um, currently being used by 10 BC communities, including Saanich and Victoria and a number of international cities around the world to evaluate their footprint and also to uh, create, understand their consumption-based greenhouse gas emission inventory. So I won't get into that piece today though, but that's also an interesting metric. So with our work in Saanich and Victoria, uh, we know the footprint locally and the results show that if everyone lived like we do here in Greater Victoria, we'd need at least at least three planets to support us. We always say that this is an underestimate. Uh, we don't like to, as, as scientists do, you don't want to overstate things, so at least three planets. This is better than the Canadian average, which is five planets. So if everyone consumed like the average Canadian, we need five planets to support us. Um, so our, our performance here locally is better um, in part because we're ble blessed with abundant hydropower. We also have relatively low heating and cooling demand. So that's some of the key factors. So looking at the details um, with the footprint, we see nearly half of our footprint is due to the food we're eating. One quarter is due to transportation and also important are buildings and consumables, which includes the consumables piece includes waste. So actions to address these footprint areas also have health implications and Trevor and I will dig into some of these interconnections. 
So this is a snapshot of the priority areas that are identified by the footprint. We break it into four categories. Um, the food, as I've already, I've already mentioned these categories, food, buildings, consumables and waste, and mobility. Um, so uh, within each of these areas, I'll highlight some key spaces we need to act on. And before I dig into the details, I just wanted to highlight one of the key pieces um, related to food. So I'll come back to this slide in a minute. So with food, it's really interesting to note, and this is a, a significant health uh, determinant as well. Um, we have the majority of the impact of food, uh, the food footprint is due to the consumption of animal products. So it's very dramatic. So half of our overall footprint is food. And within that three quarters, nearly three quarters of, of the footprint is due to uh, animal, animal product consumption. Um, so that's um, meat and also dairy, which is actually the, the major impact is for cheese, which is depressing for many people to know, um, high impact area. So shifting to more plant-based diet is one key area for action. And this is also a sensitive one to communicate. I, I totally acknowledge that we don't advocate for a complete elimination of meat, but reduction and also reduction of waste can help with that as well. Mm -hmm. So this pie chart shows the impact of the embodied energy. So embodied energy materials and resources that go into producing our food is huge. And that was talked about a little bit yesterday as well. So this vastly overshadows the impact of food miles, which are also important, um, but that embodied energy is huge. So this shows we need to really focus on upstream interventions, reducing the resource intensity of our food production system. And this can be done by local food systems, as long as we make sure they're lower input practices, which we have better handle on if we're producing these things locally rather than in big, big chains. So that's a, a great way to reduce uh, waste as well, um, shifting to more local practices. Um, so uh, next slide. So again, for food, to recap that, we want to focus on reducing food waste, both during production and consumption. Uh, half of our food is currently being wasted, which is a major resource drain. Uh, we need to redu reduce the resource inputs going into food production and also shift towards more plant-based diet. Uh, which are typically less resource intensive. So for buildings, we need to focus on fuel switching, retrofits, living and working in more efficient and smaller spaces. This can include uh, space sharing too, making sure spaces are used efficiently. Uh, for consumable goods, um, we need to tackle hyperconsumption, uh, shifting to a culture of more sharing, reusing and repairing. And for mobility, emphasizing active transportation. So all of these shifts have positive health outcomes. And I think Trevor is going to talk a little bit about those as well. And I think in fact, we can accelerate the adoption of each of these shifts by emphasizing these health outcomes and using these health outcomes as an entry point for engaging people as a really important opportunity area. So what can we do and what are we doing to act on these priorities? I'll give you a quick overview of the pilot project we've been working on in Saanich. Uh, so we joined the international One Planet Cities pilot, which is being uh, run by Bioregional UK. And I work with uh, One Earth uh, based in Vancouver. I'm based in Saanich, but uh, I work with uh, One Earth and BCIT who are based in Vancouver. Uh, we're leading this work here, work here locally. We're using the One Planet Living approach to inform action at the community level. And in this way, building a local and also international network to share ideas and support each other and learn together. Yeah. For the project, we've been using the One Planet Living framework, which unites us around a vision of sustainability. So this framework consists of these 10 principles you can see on the slide here. Um, it also embeds the ecological footprint and greenhouse gas emissions as core indicators and applies 10 One Planet, the, these principles to guide action. Uh, so importantly, this framework begins with health, happiness, and equity. Um, this acknowledges the imperative of beginning with these basic human rights. So our approach when we ran, we ran the project in Saanich, we started with a sustainability scan of the community using the principles, um, also informed by the, the footprint results to identify where we are, where we need to get to. Uh, we engage the community in a conversation about One Planet Living imperative, and Trevor's going to talk to you also about that a little bit. 
Um, and then organizations developing connected action plans to address priorities identified in the scan. So the aim is collaboration across our region will get us to local solutions faster. So it's a very he heavy emphasis on collaboration. When we build our One Planet Action Plans, we prioritize those actions that are advancing efforts on multiple principles simultaneously. And there's just a, cute, a few examples here. I did want to come back to that food example as well because this is a great opportunity area and illustrates how we can achieve multiple principles simultaneously. There's uh, good health outcomes for increasing plant-based diet, increased plant-based uh, components in your diet um, can be cheaper and can also be done in a way that contributes to building the local economy. And, and then of course the direct impacts are reducing the uh, energy and greenhouse gas emission impacts. In the work we've been doing, we're using a series of tools by Regional UK created uh, a, a oneplanet.com, which is a, a planning tool that helps uh, organizations collaborate within, within the organization and with other organizations. So uh, a nice planning tool uh, to help in facilitate action. We also, through my work with uh, BCIT, are using have uh, been developing the EcoCity footprint tool, which will be available hopefully soon to all BC communities, and we're hoping to also make it available to Canadian municipalities. Um, and that will be a way for them to calculate their ecological footprint and consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're also soon launching an app for individuals to help them understand their ecological footprints and greenhouse gas emission impacts as well. So I'm going to now hand over uh, the presentation to Mayor Haynes of Saanich, who's been a long sustainability advocate and now is a champion here locally of the One Planet Living approach and our work in the community in the region. So thank you, Mayor Haynes, and thank you for all of your leadership um, and participation. Thank you, Cora. And um, thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, having this forum. And I'm delighted to be here. And I was moved by Stephanie's introduction and uh, her amazing resume of all the work you're doing. And it's, uh, I'm struck by this um, uh, national um, gestalt as we're all on the same page trying to deliver um, uh, an important uh, sustainability for our children and the future. Um, one of the reasons I really like this uh, approach is it starts with health and happiness, not just health and happiness of people, but really health and happiness of the planet. There you see that the uh, partners and supporters and stakeholders of our local group, and one of the things we struggle with as a municipality is to br we only deal with as an organization, a corporation, a small fraction of the total pl planetary impact of our municipality. We're the eighth largest in BC, uh, we're 120,000 people. Um, and if we're going to achieve our climate mitigation targets in, in uh, 2050, and we've actually just want to accelerate those to 2030, it's critical that we can engage our residents because they are responsible for 98% of um, our municipal's uh, planetary impact. Uh, you see here, we love this um, hierarchy of health and happiness going through equity, local, local economy, right down to zero waste and zero carbon. And it's very similar to the UN 17 uh, sustainability goals. And the um, actual Puran, who's the founder of the bioregional one planet system, um, was involved in those early UN discussions. And what we're hoping to do, having pilot tested um, the system here in Saanich and seeing how it works with schools, with First Nations, with businesses, with financial groups, with faith-based groups, um, I, we've been presenting this to the regional mayors and we hope to take this from a one planet Saanich to a one planet region and then a one planet um, Island, Island, Vancouver Island. That's our ambition, and we have tools underway that are working on that. We've been hindered by COVID, but we were hoping to take this to the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities, and we're getting good traction. But each of the municipalities have their own personality and culture, and so it's interesting to see how the different mayors and their councils view this. But one of the powerful tools here is that it's free, and one of the cost factors we have is how to engage our residents. But if um, what they've done with One Planet is build this free 
platform which gives you one planet action tools each of these groups you see on the slide there have done their one planet uh, actions and they've been um, run for a year and are continuing some of them are now in there going into their third year and it forms a online collection of amazing ideas from around the world so for communities that are coming into this struggle with sustainability and respecting um, the past and respecting the future by trying to reduce our planetary impacts to have a healthier planet there's all these ideas that have already been field tested so it's like um, the friendly, friendly side of social media, if you wish. Next slide, please. Can you move next slide, Cora? Yeah, here you go. So um, let me get out, close this. I'll just change my screen here a bit. There we go. Yeah. So um, I, I jumped ahead here. You see that. Uh, we, we have the 10 guiding principles, um, but it's all based on um, a 20 year program that let us come up with um, an approach to climate change. And one of the results is we received the award for excellence in planning for our new, new accelerated idea, which is to cut our emissions in half by 2030 and net zero by 250. Um, in, involved in this is harnessing, and uh, not just the uh, municipalities, as I said, but the residents. Um, um, it's anchored in this belief that we've heard expressed by every presenter today of respecting uh, the future generations, not just of humans, but of the, of the all life forms on the planet. Um, this particular council that I work with has um, people ranging in age from 20 up to the 70s, and it's a very actively engaged council on climate change. We mentioned the um, crises that we're dealing with. We have COVID, which has launched a financial crisis. In the background of that is the housing crisis. But over all of that is this planetary climate crisis, which is not just about greenhouse gases, but as we say, the um, ability of the planet to sustain a population seems to be out of balance if it takes five planet resources. So it's critical. Uh, that we start this journey and um, I'm very proud of the work we've done at Saanich and it's been anchored on a lot of the climate change work but it's also anchored into this idea of one planet to engage all of our residents. Next slide please. Um, the concept of bouncing forward better um, and what we're trying to do is use this approach to go to the Chamber of Commerce, the Victoria Chamber of Commerce, to go to the South Island Prosperity Partnership, where we're going to engage the businesses who are large stakeholders, neighborhoods, um, all the things that you see here as examples, um, and to make it um, uh, an easier step forward, because a lot of people want to do good things. A lot of people want to help the planet and live a lighter footprint, but they struggle with how. So when you see the list there on the left, co-create better solutions for business restarts, restarts, resilient neighborhoods, healthier eating, energy transitions, active transportation, sustainable housing, regenerating natural spaces and lighter living. It's very hard for anybody to do all of those. But if somebody does some of those, and even if we get our young children to turn the light off when they leave the room, or to dry our washing on the um, lines in the garden to use sunshine versus electricity, these are all small steps. So from those tiny things to um, uh, corporations having a very different approach to how they look at their business. And in actual fact, COVID is going to help us with that because we have people working from home, which is a smaller footprint, in, in, in ways about um, do they need so much clothing? Do they need to travel so much? Do they need to eat out so much? So we can actually harness some of the um, um, dismay that's arrived with COVID to li live a, a lighter footprint. Next slide, please. Um, so what we've come to understand is that the one planet model is a very powerful tool for municipalities, myself as mayor and our council, um, to engage our residents. And if we can do that effectively, it gives us um, a manifold greater opportunity to reduce our ecological footprint and have happier and healthier lives. Thank you.
Thank you, and th thank you to both of you. Um, Cora, if you could release the screen, I think um, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so there we go. So I am going to pick up uh, from this on the, the health aspects of this. Um, you can see why I like working with uh, Mayor Haynes and Cora. They're, they're bright, they're committed, uh, they're great people to work with. And I just want to emphasize something I should have said at the outset, of course, which is that the theme for, day is, for the day is local action. So we've heard a lot about thinking globally yesterday. Today our focus has switched to local action and you've just heard a number of examples of how that can happen. So what I'm going to be talking about is the integration of health and sustainability at the local level, which is really sort of in my life course as I think about it or my career course. I used this slide yesterday, I just want to remind us that health promotion has been ecologically blind uh, until very recently, even though it was part of the founding ideas of the Ottawa Charter back in 1986, uh, and also part of the Healthy Cities concept that Len Doole and I did the background paper for as far back as 1986. In practice, health promotion has focused on the social and largely ignored the ecological determinants until recently. And of course, what we really need to do is not sort of have the ecological on one side and the social on the other, but to bring the two together. It's an eco-social project that we're involved in. So I've been writing about this for a long time, uh, at least 25 years. Um, but what we've actually seen in practice has been for years, we had healthy communities initiatives and we had sustainable communities initiatives it, going forward in parallel, often in the same municipality, but un, unconnected or very little connected, which really made no sense. And so I've been trying to get this integration to happen. Um, and, and the one planet approach is, is to my mind, a way to do that. Um, and I call it uh, Healthy Communities 2.0. I just want to... Uh, take a quick look at this many of you may not have heard about this but in the run-up to habitat 3 which was held in quito in ecuador uh, the third un conference on uh, built environments and cities and urban settlements uh, organized by un habitat um, there were a series of urban think tanks around the world and i did the keynote speech for the one um, in Kuching in Sarawak back about three or four years ago, out of which came something called the Kuching Statement. It was the only um, uh, sort of urban think tank in pre preparation for Habitat 3 that focused on health. And so we produced a statement that talked about people, planet and participation. And those are the three themes that guide my work in, in Healthy Cities 2.0. So obviously people in terms of people's physical, mental and social well-being, and I would argue it's the core business of cities, but it has to be done within the constraints of the one planet that is our home. But the third piece, and it's something that Mayor Haynes has stressed, is the participation part of this. Um, in order to put people and planet at the heart of governance, the statement said, healthy, just and sustainable cities engage fully with their citizens and community organizations and so that participation piece is very much key to this and it's something i'll come back to shortly uh, again you've already seen this but i do want to stress because i think it's so important um, that bioregionals 10 principles of one planet living start with health and happiness then they include equity and local economy then they include culture and community so this is not about just sustainability in the usual natural resources and environment sense. This is social and ecological sustainability combined. And as Mayor Hayes said, the health and happiness being first is, is key. There are, and Cora has already touched on this, many health co-benefits. She, she mentioned the food one already at the top for the footprint. Uh, if you look at transportation, almost three quarters of the transportation footprint is due to private vehicles. If you look at buildings, almost three quarters of the footprint is operating energy. And so that gives us some really good places to start from. We can narrow down and say, these are the places where if you tackle these, you get the big wins. And of course, the good news is that virtually all of them have 
health co-benefits. In fact, they all do. This, for example, is the new Canada Food Guide that came out in 2019. Now, it wasn't created from a sustainability, low meat diet perspective. It was created from what's a healthy diet. But if you look at what's there, that is a low animal protein diet and uh, it's a healthy diet. And in fact, estimates have suggested, first of all, that this is actually a cheaper diet for the average family in Canada than the previous food guide. And secondly, that it will create uh, better health. So there's a wonderful win-win-win here in moving towards a low meat diet. And I agree with Coral, I, I don't stress veganism or vegetarianism, I'm neither, but low meat will take us a long, long way. So these were some of the key recommendations out of the work by Jenny Moore and Cora Holdsworth when they looked at this footprint for Sanit, you've heard most of them. But eliminate fossil fuel emissions in buildings, convert half of gasoline private vehicles to electric, reduce purchase of non-food consumable by 30%. Now think about that. We eat too much. We know we eat too much. That's why we have a, an obesity problem. Uh, part of it is because portion sizes have grown bigger and we're offered a lot and like good people we clear our plates. So eating less which is and purchasing less food is really done to reduce food waste but it will also address the obesity problem um, and so on. Uh, so purchasing less food at the bottom, purchasing, uh, reducing purchase of non-food consumables as well. So all that stuff that, that uh, we really don't need. Uh, and that we need to stop uh, essentially wasting. So very quickly I looked at the, uh, at the principles other than uh, the other nine principles in the healthy uh, the One Planet Living uh, and I'm not going to go through all of these you can read them for yourselves but for each of those principles you can easily identify health co-benefits. The health co-benefits of greater equity have, were very well laid out in the book Spirit Level but we also know that a local economy creates local jobs and local wealth. And I'm actually, my column that will be coming out this weekend uh, addresses exactly that. Uh, in terms of culture and community, strengthening, strengthening community is one of the five key strategies of the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. We know that strengthening social connections, strengthening sense of community, sense, strengthening a sense of belonging is very important to people's mental and social well-being and therefore to their physical well-being. Um, land and nature, uh, say low pollution and adequately properly planned city, one with low levels of air pollution, um, we know that nature contact has significant physical, mental and health benefits. All of these are health co-benefits of one planet living. Sustainable water the same. Uh, not just an adequate supply, but also good sanitation. We've already touched on local and sustainable food. Public health has done a lot of work on the health co-benefits of active transportation. Um, and these are all selling points. So whether you come at the food issue from the point of view of the Canada Food Guide as a health issue or from the point of view of the Lancet Commission on a healthy sustainable diet from an environmental perspective you end up in the same place. The same for travel and transportation. So you can do this because it's good for the environment, you can do it because it's good for health because it's both. Um, having less stuff and producing those products in cleaner and greener ways, uh, reducing wastes, um, and so on. And obviously at the bottom, the zero carbon energy, the climate crisis that underpins so much of our thinking. So lots and lots of health co-benefits. And so as we think about what we in public health do at the local level in creating healthy communities, we need to recognize that almost always if it's good for health, it's good for the environment. And in particular, that if it's good for the environment, it's good for health. But then participation is key and I'm just going to reflag the statement from the Kuching statement to that effect. So I just want to end by talking a little bit about my current work. Uh, I've established a new, uh, we became an NGO in November but we've been around for about three years. We call it Conversations for a One Planet Region and it's really very simple. Okay. On the left, how we behave. Um, and and uh, as Cora said, at least three and probably more than three planets worth at a local level. But of course, all we have is what you see on the right. And so essentially, 
the conversations is based around the very simple point at the bottom. Shouldn't we be talking about this? Isn't this some conversation we should be having? And our whole purpose as an organization is to, our, our vision is that this region, the Greater Victoria region, will achieve social and ecological sustainability, as Mayor Hayden said, going from one planet Saanich to one planet region. Um, but at the same time, reducing our ecological footprint and ensuring a high quality of life for everybody. So that and good health. So that's where the equity element comes in. So our mission is very simple. It's to establish and maintain community wide conversations. We're not talking about it very little anyway, in certain spots, in certain places, among certain people, maybe. But as a community, no. And also note at the bottom, we have a sort of slogan that guides our, a lot of our work, learn, discuss, imagine, design, create. We're at, we've been at the learn and discuss end for the last three years. We've certainly need to do a whole lot more to spread that around, but we also need to move into the imagining and designing end of this. What would a, what would your one planet neighborhood look like? What would it be like to live in that? So that's what conversations does. So uh, this is our new website. Um, talks about the two big challenges. We act as if we have several planets, but we're not talking about this or what it means for our children, our grandchildren, our communities, future generations. Uh, so that's, that's the business we're in. And uh, that's it. I will leave it at that. It gives us a few minutes um, in which we can have some uh, discussion or comments. Um, please do use the chat box because um, we can't have 150 people all trying to speak at the same time. Um, so if you've got comments or questions, uh, this would be a, a good time to put them in there and we'll try and respond to them. While we're just waiting to give people a chance to compose their thoughts and type stuff in, uh, Cora or, or Fred, anything to add to what I've said there? Yes. I'd like to um, mention something, uh, Trevor. Um, I, I knew you would be getting into the mental health side, but what we're dealing with at the municipal level is uh, we, we're calling it angst, uh, climate angst. And so many people are having mental health issues, which is also affecting their, their physical health. And of course, it's overlaid with COVID now about what are we going to do with this planetary crisis? Um, if, People understand the planet can't sustain the current population given our current practices. And what we've found is that the faith groups, the schools, uh, the colleges, the businesses that engage in this report a better mental tone that the individuals, even if it's just a small project, of growing some vegetables, young children in the garden is one, or helping clothes be recycled by having food, uh, sorry, clothes swaps at schools. All these things are giving people a sense that, although it's a massive problem that you can't really get at individual, individually, you actually can get at it individually. So with what we've been able to do is shift the dialogue from governments have to do all of this to say, no, every individual has to participate in this. And that's been one of the great benefits of uh, the One Planet. And I have to compliment Trevor and Cora in helping us articulate that message. Also, the staff that we have in Saanich are completely um, alive to this issue. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on one of the uh, items that are coming up in the chat, and it's about how does this play out in uh, smaller rural communities and also conversely larger cities? and. And then also the idea of engaging people from uh, those regions as well. Um, that's one thing. So we, I was saying we are developing a lighter footprint app as a, a means for engaging individuals. And right now it is kind of based on a, it was developed initially for Vancouver. And so the framing is really resonating um, with a Vancouver audience. And I think similarly for Victoria as well. But we, with our pilot communities we have for looking at our ecological footprint assessments and consumption-based emission inventories, they're pointing out the areas uh, where those messaging doesn't resonate as well. So I, I personally would like to develop um, a lighter footprint calculator and app that 
um, does reach those different audience types as well that might have different motivations. Um, and I think it's about figuring out those entry points. And I think health, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think health is a really excellent entry point. Um, but also acknowledging what uh, Mayor Haynes is talking about, the angst as well. It has to be done in a gentle way because people are stressed out. So um, I don't really know what the answer is yet, but it is definitely something that I personally am exploring too. And it kind of actually ties in the uh, Thomas Homer Dixon's presentation yesterday too. How do we achieve that tipping point to mobilize as many people as possible? I think there's already lots of engaged and active people in Vancouver, but some of the other Northern BC communities where we're working in, uh, communities are struggling to engage people um, on a broader scale, and I, sh I shouldn't paint a broad brush there, but uh, this is the the feedback I've had from some of the municipalities we're working at, at in more rural areas too. So that would be a great discussion topic for this group, um, how to achieve that, um, that tipping point. And that's a huge amount of the population too. So how do we effectively uh, communicate and engage to different populations, um, the broad population, basically. Maybe I can pick up on um, a conversation that's been going on in the chat box around the issue of obesity and food purchasing. So first of all, I'm not suggesting that it's simply a matter of buying less food. I think though that you have to recognize that we have seen, I always call it the elephant in the room, that one of the big things we don't talk about with respect to uh, food is the fact that portion size has increased 30 to 50 percent in the last 30 to 50 years. Uh, plate size in North America has increased. All sorts of ways of presenting food have increased. Um, supersizing and ideas like that. So there's been a, an attitude that more is better. Um, one product of that is that we create a lot of food waste. A lot of stuff gets un left and uneaten, which is a, a very large part of our food ecological footprint. So I'm not suggesting that simply buying less is, is the answer. There's a whole lot of reasons behind obesity. It's a complex issue. I was part of the National um, Steering Committee that put together a national uh, uh, obesity strategy uh, some decade or so ago. Uh, so I understand the complexity of that, but there is a piece of it around how much food we buy and how much we really need and how much we consume that is a piece of that. Um, as to the Canada Food Guide, uh, it may not be perfect, but I think it's a, it's a step forward from where it was last time. Uh, certainly it moves us towards a low meat diet, and I think that's good. And the Lancet Commission, as I said, on eat the Eat Lancet Commission on food and, uh, and sustainability, um, very much the diet they recommend is very much like the Canada Food Guide, in fact they came out at about the same time. So I think it's part of the conversation we have to be having about what, what sort of, what sort of syst food, agri-food system do we need that presents us with healthy choices and makes the healthy choice the easy choice, whereas right now too often we make the unhealthy choice the easy choice and then wonder why people make unhealthy choices. The other thing I'm seeing in the chat box was around uh, what does what this work in, in, north, in uh, northern communities? Um, and there was a reference here to um, how, how do we do this in the north where we depend on fossil fuels and so on. We are going to have to figure out how to get out of fossil fuels. And of course, there are some places that are more challenging than others. But we can look to other places in the world, such as Germany, that are well on the way to f phasing out fossil fuel as well as nuclear power. Um, we can look at, um, at how much energy we actually need and how we increase energy efficiency. And it came up in the conversation yesterday around uh, ecological economics, but in Alberta, for example, there's a group, I can't remember its name, I think it's called uh, Earth and Iron or something like that, but it's a group of energy workers um, that have formed to look at how do you make the just transition and create good new jobs for people who are currently working in the fossil fuel sector. So we need to be looking at these. This is not going to be an overnight change, but we have to be having that conversation. And it's maybe a more challenging conversation in, in some parts of the country than others, but it's, that doesn't mean it's not a conversation we shouldn't be having.
Um, Trevor, if I may, the um, chat, chat room has raised a number of interesting topics, um, several of which you've addressed and I'm feeling really grateful for the caliber and quality of, and insight that's arising and the use of the chat. Um, there was a comment about race um, and racialized communities and um, also vulnerable communities and engagement with vulnerable communities in the conversation. I think yesterday provided quite a bit of insight around the interconnectedness of um, uh, the social issues that we are addressing with respect to the Anthropocene. So I'm just um, wondering, with respect to One Planet, um, how is that conversation unfolding in terms of vulnerable communities and racialized persons? Well, it's it's something that we're very concerned with ourselves because, um, to a certain extent, to the thus far the conversations they started as simply a set of monthly meetings in the local the central public library to talk about this, and they're sort of evolving. But since becoming an NGO, we've increased our board. We've recently brought on board Jasmine Rajawanda, who's very much working with racialized communities as a cultural planner. Uh, so we're working with her on how do we do a much better job than we have thus far to reach out. That also applies with indigenous communities. And how do we work with indigenous communities? One approach we're looking at, so we're, we're beginning to develop a spectrum of ideas for conversations. And at one end of that spectrum is kitchen table conversations. So we're trying to put, to, or we are putting together uh, a, a guide that will enable people to sit around their kitchen table with their family, their friends, their neighbors, and just start a, a, a basic conversation about the idea of being of, of one planet living and one planet regions and what does that mean for us. Um, and that's something that we, um, that we intend to disseminate very widely so that anyone in any community can pick it up and we can help people to do that. So it's something we're, we're trying to come to grips with. I certainly don't think we've got the answers to it yet, but it's certainly something we're very aware of and are trying to address. Um, well, I think um, we've got some experts on in, in this meeting and in the room who will be able to be supportive of that. And um, I'm really grateful for the openness. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's very clear based on our work and the alignment of these um, social uh, movements, really, um, that uh, the time has come. So that's great. Thank you so much. I just put something else up on the screen quickly. I know we're almost, well, I think maybe we're almost out of time, but um, there was also a comment in the chat box about um, exploring the opportunities presented by COVID-19 and yes. the shifts, shifts that are occurring. And this is something we've been up exploring with our One Planet Saanich group. Um, and just, I think all of us are thinking about these things and this is not new information, but we've started to compile what are these shifts that we're exploring or experiencing and what um, what is it identifying that we need to change? So I think there's definitely opportunities to build from what we're seeing uh, through COVID-19 and using that as a, also as an entry point um, into uh, making these changes. And we're seeing this uh, proliferation of people caring about each other more and expressing that care and concern and uh, building from that is uh, definitely a key area to build from. I, I know That's a very powerful slide. Cora, thank you for that. I wonder if you could send it on to me as a slide, um, because that I think is one of the advantages we're seeing that um, the devastation of COVID is, is remarkable. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing changes in human behavior. And many people are saying, well, if we can do this for COVID to save us from a pandemic, surely we can do some of these things to save the planet. Um, so I really like this slide. If you could send it to me, that would be great. Whoever sent that in, thank you very much. Yeah, we will um, get that into the um, summary of the program for everyone um, if you make sure that Christina gets it. And if you just want to email it, it's um, coordinator at phabc.org. Okay, it was in my original slide deck, but with the 20 minutes, it, I didn't make the cut. So <laughs> I did have it initially in there, but I had to chop really, it. Really, really yeah. appreciate getting three speakers through a plenary with this much content and richness. I just want to congratulate the three of you. Really, really appreciative. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you for the invitation.